Okay, this is the first lecture of chapter three. And chapter three is all about the atom. So where it came from, how we got here, what are the parts of it, and then specifically how we can count atoms. And I know what you're thinking. How can you count an atom? Does that sound logical? Why does that not sound logical? They're way too small, right? So, But we can actually count them. And there's a way we can count them, and we'll talk about that. One of the things I told you a while back is we're going to celebrate Mold Day. Um, Mold Day is actually already passed. It was this past Sunday. It was October 23rd. And here's the reason why we uh, we have postponed the celebration of Mold Day. is before we get to Mold Day and you can celebrate it, you need to know what it is. We're going to learn what it is in this chapter. So tentatively, it has been scheduled for November 10th. Um, depending on how far we get, that's, again, tentative. And, and I'll talk about a little bit more about it once I understand how, how we're progressing um, from going from here. Okay. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about in this section one is the law of conservation of mass, law of different proportions and multiple proportions. And then we're going to talk about five points of Dalton's atomic theory, and then we're going to compare and contrast a few things then. So the first thing, the transformation of a substance. Let me pause there. What does a transformation mean? It's a change. Okay. So it is a change. So a transformation of a substance or substances into one or more new substances is known as a chemical reaction. Okay. So in a chemical reaction, what are those things that we start with? Okay. Reactants, and they go to what? Products. Very good. Now, I told you a long time ago there were five signs that your eyeballs could tell you a chemical reaction. Or raise your hand. What, is the, what are those five, Shine? No, just give me one of them. Bubbles. Oxidation. What is the normal name for iron that oxidizes? Silver. Lead. It's a weird word. Patina. Yes, no, maybe. Yes, okay. All right, any others? No. Say that again. Color change. Solid. What do we call solid forming? What's that P word? Precipitate. And the last one? Heat and light. Very good. So those are the five ways your eyeball says, hi, hello, I'm a chemical reaction. Okay. Now, when those things happen, this is an important thing. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this right here is a test question. That's a test question. The law of conservation of mass is, mass is neither created nor destroyed during an ordinary chemical reaction or physical change. It's always going to be there. So another way to say it is what you start with is what you must end with. We are going to do a lab on this. So let me kind of, it's a very simple, basic lab, but it's, it's somewhat fun to do. It's kind of visually stimulating. Let me tell you why. What we're going to do is we're going to take baking soda and acetic acid, and we're going to do, it, we're going to do the same reaction twice. The first time, we're going to put it in a beaker. We're going to measure the mass of what we have before, and we're going to let it react, and we're going to measure the mass of it after it reacts. Then we're going to take the exact same stuff, but then we're going to put it in a volumetric flask, and we're going to put a balloon on top of it. And we're going to see what happens when it reacts and how the balloon can potentially affect the mass and, and what we're doing with that balloon. So visually, it's kind of fun, uh, and the, and, but it's going to prove to you that there is a reason we need to do conservation of mass. And again, we talked about thermo in the last topic, and that was the exact same concept for energy. So there's two conservation laws. One's with mass, one is with energy. So what you start with, you must end with. Okay? All right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that these two things are test questions. So, so far, the first two slides, we've got three test questions. Okay? All I need you to know is the definition of all three of these. The definition of the law of conservation of mass, the definition of the law of definite proportions, and the definition of the law of multiple proportions. Now, they may be asked backwards, so make sure you know them both ways. I could give you the definition and say, what is this the law of? And make sure you kind of know it from that perspective. All right, so let's talk about the differences. The law of definite proportions, this is what it says. A chemical compound, let me stop right there. Somebody give me an example of any chemical compound. Salt, what do you mean by salt? Give me a specific salt. Sodium chloride, that's a chemical compound. Anything else? Water? Somebody besides Seth? Harrison, give me one. Sure? Not? No? Carbon dioxide. Sucrose. Anything else? 
it's a bunch it's this thing that's made up of a bunch of atoms that are chemically bonded that's a chemical compound any of those things so a chemical compound contains the same elements in exactly the same proportions so let's pause right there same elements same proportion this is what you need to circle or highlight by mass that's the key part about definite proportions it's the same elements in exactly the same proportions by mass and here's the key phrase regardless of the size of the sample so let's talk about water for just a second if I have a little water or a lot of water does every single water molecule look the exact same and does it weigh the exact same all of them it doesn't matter if you've got a few of them or a lot of them every water molecule is identical especially percent proportion by mass let me explain that a long time ago I told you this there was one chemical formula that I asked you guys to memorize the molar mass for and it was for water does anyone remember the molar mass of water Not write that down that's the only mass of any of the compounds that I'm asking you to memorize. So one water molecule, just one, weighs 18.02 grams per mole. Now, I know that last part, that per mole, makes no sense to you today, but in the next few weeks, it'll make a lot of sense. So that's the only number I'm asking you to memorize is 18.02. So here's the deal. The whole thing weighs 18.02 grams. How many different parts make up water? Two parts. What are the two parts? Oxygen and hydrogen. So do you agree that hydrogen makes up a part and oxygen makes up a part? Does anybody happen to remember, if you could look at the periodic table, if you could see it from where you're sitting, it's really far away, what we rounded the mass of oxygen to? Do I remember? 16. So of the 18.02 grams... 16 of it is made up of oxygen. So what does that mean that the rest is made up of? Hydrogen. And how much would be the rest of it? 2.02, right? So of the 18.02 grams, 2.02 of it's hydrogen. Now here's the tricky part of it. How many hydrogens are involved in this thing? Two of them. So how much is each hydrogen? 1.01. And if you looked on the periodic table, and again, I know you can't see it. It's way too far away. It's too small. The mass of each hydrogen is 1.01 rounded to the to two decimal places. And so when you go back and you reread this um, statement, it says a chemical compound contains the same elements in exactly the same proportions by mass. So regardless of how many water molecules I have, is every water molecule 2.02 grams of hydrogen? And is every water molecule 16 grams of oxygen? And they all add up to be how much? 18.02. That's what definite proportions mean. So let's talk about multiple proportions. The law of multiple proportions. If two or more different compounds, what does that mean? Are they the same? They're different. And here's the key part. Are composed of the same two elements. So let me give you two examples. You may want to jot these down. So we're talking about something like carbon dioxide versus carbon monoxide or water versus that. Does anybody know what H2O2 is? Very good. Hydrogen peroxide. So let me reread that statement one more time. It says two different compounds composed of the same elements. CO2 and CO. Are they different? But are they the same compound? The same elements. Right? H2O and H2O2. Are they different compounds? Same elements. This is what I'm talking about. Okay, This is where it gets really weird. And I, I'm going to summarize it. I'm going to make it a lot easier than it sounds. This is what it says. And again, it, it sounds ridiculous. It says, the ratio of the masses of the second element combined with a certain mass of the first element is always a ratio of small whole numbers. And I was thinking, what does that mean? Let me give you a very, very basic explanation of that. The thing I want you to circle or highlight is small whole numbers of stuff in green. And let me and when I say like okay, that makes complete sense. When you see 
any chemical formula ever in your entire life, have you ever seen a subscript in a chemical formula that's a decimal number? No. And you're never going to. So the whole gist of this is that all of these subscripts will always be what kind of numbers? Whole numbers. That's what it's trying to say. So anytime you see a compound, it's always going to be a whole number ratio. It's never going to be a decimal. Does that make a little bit more sense? And again, I know that's kind of convoluted and, and confusing, but all I need you to know is the definition of these two. Can you recognize the definition? Okay. All right. So let's talk about Dalton. First of all, do me a favor, at the very top, this was in 19, excuse me, not 19, 1803. Dalton's a really important guy, and here's why. In the terms of world history, is 1803 a long time ago in terms of world history? No, I mean, that's actually fairly recent in world history. Think about how, like, B.C., how far back we go. But in terms of scientific history, is it a long time ago? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about 1600s is when they really kind of got going. It's really slow developing. And over the past 100 years, we have exponentially increased our understanding and knowledge of science. So here's why Dalton was so important. Okay? Before the likes of like Galileo and all those smart people, what did they think about the shape of the earth? They said it was flat, right? Okay. What about the people, uh, what, how do they think the sun and the um, earth were related? A long time ago. The sun revolved around us, right? Okay. The people who went against that, back then it was the, the church people, right? The clergymen who were always the smart people who said all that stuff. The people who went against them like had their heads chopped off. Like, that's how intense it was that you did not go against the smart people back then. So Dalton's atomic theory in 1803 was never heard of before. Like, he was the first person to ever discuss these things. So think about the time frame that he lived in and some of the things he said that we take for granted today, that we already know. We know all of this stuff. But back then, it was like saying the world was round when everyone else thought it was flat. It was just a crazy thing. So he has five postulates. Now, again, postulate is just a fancy word for hypothesis. So here's what I want to do with these. I want to look at all five, and I want to try to determine if he was right or if he was wrong. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say all right, how accurate was he for 1803. And then if he was wrong, we want to talk about why he was wrong. So number one, all matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. True or false? That's true. So write true beside number one. Write true beside number one. Okay. I'm going to come back to number two, and there's a reason why I'm going to come back to number two. Number three. Atoms cannot be, N-O-T, cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. Is that true or false? That is false. What is a subdivision in terms of like land? Taking a really big piece and making it into smaller parts. Have atoms been found to have smaller parts? What are they? Very good. So subdivided means it's been found to have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Do those symbols make sense before I go any further? P positive, protons, N naught, neutrons, and E negative, or E minus is electrons. Okay. Have atoms ever been created? Yeah. Remember that periodic table you all had to color? All those bubble letters that you had to draw that you hated? All those were man-made created elements. They're not found in nature. They had to be created. So you can create them. And then can they be destroyed? Is there anywhere in Dothan that does that? Farley. That's what Farley does every day. What are they? What atom are they out there destroying? Uranium. That's what a nuclear power plant does. It takes uranium and it splits it in half and it releases all this energy and it creates all this energy that we can use as electrical energy. So that is necessarily not true anymore. Okay, so let's go back and let's look at number two. He said atoms of given elements are identical in size, mass, and other properties. So what he's saying is that if you went out and you dug up all these atoms, if you could see them, that every atom of carbon or every atom of hydrogen or every atom of iron is 100% identical in size and mass. Is that true or false? 
that is false. And here's why. The first thing we're going to talk about is why they're different in masses. Okay, So a difference in mass. Okay, It is called the isotope. Does anyone happen to know the definition of an isotope? Anybody? That's a fact. My eight-year-old niece can memorize that. We need to talk about why. Okay. An atom. And again, you don't have to draw this. I'm just doing, doing it for visual effect. Does anybody know what is in the center of an atom? Nucleus. Very good. We're just going to call it the nucleus. And again, you don't have to draw this for right now. And then out here, what's going on out here? What are all those things? What do we call this area? What would you say? Yeah, the electron cloud. Well, we've taken care of three of the things, or one of the things. So if the electrons are running around the atom, what two things are inside of the atom? Protons. And so we've got the protons, and we've got the neutrons on the inside. Here's the part that we need to understand about what an isotope is. All those numbers on the periodic table that you guys had a number that you probably wanted to beat me with a stick with, so you had to number 1 through 118, one, two, three, they're in sequential order, right? Does anyone know what those numbers represent? It's, it's called the atomic number, which represents the what? The number of protons. Okay? So if I'm talking about element number six, who is that? Carbon. So if I say that the atom that I'm talking about has seven protons, is that a completely different element? Yes. So can an isotope have different number of protons. No, the reason why is because if you change protons, you change the element, right? And it's, what we wrote says it's the same element. Okay, well, here's the deal. So if we're talking about the mass aspect of it, the two things that make up the mass are the protons and the neutrons. Well, if you change protons, you change the element. So what does that leave? The neutrons. So this is what I want you to write. This is the reason why. Because... It has different number of neutrons. And that does look like a degree symbol. So the reason isotopes are what they are is because it's the same element that has a different mass because it has a different number of what specifically? Neutrons. Okay, that's the important aspect about this. Need a pause for just a second. I need. Okay, so I want you to write this. These three things. Okay. These are the three specific hydrogen isotopes. They have names. Most of them don't. Hydrogens just happen to have names. Now, remember, you just wrote it down. What is the definition of an isotope? Same element, different mass. So, what two things make up the mass? Protons and neutrons. Okay, Which one of these do all three of them have in common? They have the same number of protons, right? How many protons does each one of these have? Very good. So this is one proton, this is one proton, and this is one proton. How do we know that's true? 
its atomic number is 1. Hydrogen is always number 1. All right. So I'm going to add a fact, and then I want to see if we can figure out the result of this. The prefix is the mass. The prefix is the mass. So, I know this is going to kind of look weird, but I'm setting it up this way for a reason. I mean, if you want to do it like this, there's a blank that we're going to we're going to fill in something right here. So, I'm setting it up like this for a reason. So, let's start with the easiest prefix. What prefix up there do you know? Tri. What does tri stand for? Three. So, if the mass of tritium is three. Well, think about it. If you, need, if you have three total and you have one proton... And how many neutrons would you have? What's one plus two? What's one plus two? Three. Did anybody ever take in French? Anybody? <laughs> what is dia in French? Dia. It's two. All right, well, let's think again. If you've got one proton and you have a total of two, how many neutrons you got? One. And then finally, just by process of elimination, what do you think the prefix pro means? One. Well, if you've got a total of one and you all and you only have one proton, then how many neutrons can you have? You can't have any of them. Now, the reason that this is difficult is that most people forget that the prefix means the mass and not the number of neutrons. So just another way to kind of visualize it is it's the mass minus one for the number of neutrons. You may see these as far as like, do you know, as far as a test question, which of the following is not one of the three isotopes of hydrogen? So I just need you to know the names of the three of them. I'm not going to ask you how many it has of each of them. So just make sure you know the three names of the hydrogen isotopes. Protium, deuterium, and tritium. Most elements have more than one isotope. There's one more that I want to show you. You don't have to necessarily know these, but I just want to show it to you as far as just making sure we're kind of all on the same page. What element is that? Carbon. All carbons have how many protons? What number is it? It's number six. Okay. So... How many neutrons would carbon-12 have? Because 6 plus 6 is 12. How many about 13? 7, 14 is 8. Okay. If we walked outside in the real world and dug up 100 carbon atoms, and this is just kind of a real, a real world application here, 98% of them are going to be carbon-12. So if I had a bag of 100 of them, how many would not be carbon-12? Two of them. Okay. Why is that? That is a great question, and that was a question that we have put Teddy down on. It's his job to find out why isotopes exist. And it's, it's interesting you ask that. That is one of the things that still eludes scientists and chemists and physicists. They have no idea why they occur. It's just a natural phenomenon that exists. That we don't really know why it has different numbers and the way it's built. It's, a, it's an interesting question. We just don't know the answer to it. And I'm sure there are people trying to figure it out, but nature designed it to be that way. Um... The crazy part about it is is that carbon, so again, you don't have to know this. This is about 98%. This is like 1.9%. Well, what does that leave carbon-14? 0.1%. So it's very, 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 very rare in nature to ever find it. Um, does anyone know what carbon-13 is used for? It's used for carbon dating. What's carbon dating used for? how old something is, like fossils and bones and crazy stuff like that. So that's what carbon-13. Now, why and how it's used, I have no clue. I just know that's what it's used for. Yes, ma'am. What? Uh-huh, the air duster stuff? What? I don't know what it is. I'm assuming it's just compressed air. Is it? Does it? Where? 
It is. It's just compressed air. This is almost empty. Is that again? It's yeah. Yeah, if you if you inhale it, it's got some sort of I don't know, some sort of chemical that can give you a high. two Dalton Atomic Theory postulates. Number four, the atomic, excuse me, atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. Is that true or false? That is true. Again, this is exactly what we said a second ago. Will you ever see a decimal number in a chemical formula? No. So that is true. He was right about that. And last but not least, it says in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, and rearranged. True or false? In a chemical reaction, atoms are combined, which means they can come together to make new things. They are separated and they're broken down into separate things. Or they're rearranged and swap places. That is true. Very good. That is true. That's exactly what a chemical reaction is. That is very true. So now, holistically, how good did Dalton do? Three out of five. I mean, that's a 60, but in 1803, that's really good. So he missed number two and number three. So we verbalized it. We talked about it out loud. So if you were reading the notes, this is the slide that what we verbalized. So not all aspects of Dalton's atomic theory have been proven correct. So these are the two he missed. We know that now atoms are divisible into smaller parts. They can be created in a lab, um, and they can be... Um, subdivided into smaller parts. All those things are true. We also know that a given element can have atoms with different masses, and that's what we talked about isotopes with. Some of the important concepts still are true, the fact that everything is composed of atoms, and that different elements have different properties. That is absolutely true. Is iron and lead the same thing? They have completely different properties, just like aluminum and carbon, just like hydrogen and nitrogen. They're different. They have different properties, which makes sense. All right, so this is the part where it gets into the missing page. So you may have to look at it a little bit different. So this is the first slide of the added page. Right? I think so. Okay. You already know this. This is just extra bonus added information. The atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains chemical properties of that element. So if you have one atom of iron, it acts like iron. The nucleus is a very small region located in the center of the atom. Do me a favor. I want you to add a fact to this. It is 99.9% of mass and less than 1% of space. Let me say that so you can read it. I know it's kind of hard to read. It's 99% of the mass... And it's less than 1% of the space. When you hear that, you probably don't comprehend what you're writing. Think about that for a second. Imagine if I told you that the smallest part of you, it takes up less than 1% of who you are, is 99.9% .9 of how much you weigh. Does that make sense at all? You're right. It doesn't make sense. And that's why... The, Sometimes chemistry is, is non-comprehendable. We can't understand that concept. That less than 1% of the space taken up by an atom is made up 99% of its mass. That's crazy to think about that. But that just tells you how small these things are. Okay? Uh, the nucleus is made up of at least one positively charged uh, particle called a proton. And usually, again, usually one or more particles that are neutral called neutrons. What's the only atom? on the face of the planet that doesn't have any neutrons. Just wrote it down. The only atom that has no neutrons, protium. Protium is the only exception to that. Okay? It has no neutrons. Okay? Now, this is kind of a cool picture. This is using electron microscope and electron graph. This is a picture of a, of a level that's one atom thick. 
So all those little bubbles or all those little hills, those are all one singular atom. And they actually, now IBM's doing it, they can actually take and make pictures out of one atom layer thick. It's really kind of cool. I'm going to find you all some pictures and show it to you. Okay. All right, we'll stop there for today. I'm going to show you all those pictures.